the venue chosen is the ends of the earth. <laughs> what if Jafar won? This is fanscription. Jafar is at least near the top of many fans' lists of the best villains the Mouse House has ever produced. While he was defeated in spectacular fashion at the end of the first Aladdin film, he did make a comeback in 1994's Return of Jafar. While you can argue the quality of that direct-to-video sequel, Jafar being at the center of it says a lot about the former royal vizier's popularity. But what if, like Scar early on in The Lion King, Jafar achieved victory? and became leader of the kingdom he was trying to conquer? What if our heroes failed and Agrabah succumbed to the dark reign of a sorcerer sultan? What would become of Jasmine, her father, Genie, and Aladdin? Disney Elseworlds is here to answer those questions. So, with the same pieces in play and the same spirit in mind, let's craft a darker take on this Arabian night. Most of the first film remains the same. Our changes don't start until Aladdin is jettisoned out of Agrabah. When the magic carpet tries to join Aladdin and Abu before they're sent off, Jafar catches it with a wave of his magic and unravels carpet then and there. Thus, there is no immediate way for Aladdin to return to save his home. The shot of Jafar laughing over the Sultan and Jasmine lingers for a bit longer as we fade to black. That would be the end of the first Aladdin film. Now instead of Return of Jafar as the sequel, we're going with a direct continuation of the first film's storyline. We open part two on the palace tower landing in the snow. Aladdin is in the middle of a blizzard on the other side of the world. He finds Abu, but without carpet, he's stranded. I made a mess of everything. Somehow, I gotta go back and set things right. Aladdin walks and walks and walks more. Trying his best to keep Abu warm, our hero is determined to find shelter, but the snowstorm is too much for him. After a while, he faints from exhaustion and the cold. A figure close by hears the loud crunch of the snow and walks up to Aladdin and Abu's nearly lifeless bodies. We cut to a cave lit by a dim fire. The unforgiving wind howls outside as Aladdin awakens. Groggy, he sees the figure, cloaked from head to toe, cooking food on a fire. Ah. You're alive. Aladdin's memories come flooding back to him. Jasmine! He tries to stand, but finds he's too weak. Oh, take it easy, young man. Who are you? Where am I? I am Vadik, and you are a long way from home. Aladdin goes on to explain some of his situation, but Vadik is not inclined to believe him. Genies, princesses, magic carpets, and a talking parrot. Sounds like a tall tale to me. But you and your monkey survived all by yourselves out there. That means you're tough. A survivor. The organization I work for is always on the lookout for people of your caliber, Alain. You should think about joining up. It's not like you have anywhere else to go. I just need to get back to Agrabah. Aladdin spots a golden staff with a bright green gem exposed in the satchel Vadik was carrying. What were you doing all the way out here by yourself anyway? The Traveler notices what Aladdin saw and packs away the staff. Tell you what, you come back with me and talk to our leader. He's a wise man. I bet he could help you. I don't know. Have it your way. The storm's just picking up. I'm sure you'll be fine. Aladdin looks outside to see the blizzard is even more furious than before. He has no other choice. All right, I'll go. Good, we leave it on. Vadik then snuffs out the fire in the dark cave. Back in Agrabah, it's several weeks later. The situation is much the same as it was in the movie. Jafar is in total control. His sorcery strikes fear into the kingdom as he rules from on high. Jasmine is his personal servant, and Genie is always kept close by. It is revealed that Jafar's first official act as ruler was to throw the former sultan into the dungeon. He's not been heard from since, and his fate is deliberately kept from his daughter. Jasmine is defiant, but her spirit has been wounded by rumors of her father's likely death. Jafar tries a few times to get her to marry him, but she refuses. This latest time leads Jafar to a different course of action. 
I wish for Princess Jasmine to fall desperately in love with me. Genie tries to explain that's one of the three things he's not able to do. He goes on to tell Jafar the other two rules. I can't kill anybody. <laughs> yeah, so don't ask. Rule number three! I can't bring people back from the dead. It's not a pretty picture. I don't like doing it! Jafar snaps at Genie, calling him worthless. But then he catches himself. Genie may be bound by the rules of the lamp, but he's not. Jafar's power is the greatest any human on Earth possesses. He's no genie, but he's also not subject to the same limitations. If you won't marry me, princess, maybe another member of your royal family will. He conjures up as much black magic as he can, and genie can tell what he's about to do. He tries to stop the sorcerer, warning him that there's a reason genies have rules. Jafar shuts him up by sending him back to the lamp and banishing him to an isolated tower in the palace. Jafar goes mad, letting out an almost demonic laugh. Green mist fills the room as a figure forms in the center. Lightning cracks and thunder roars. Suddenly, everything stops. Jafar goes to the figure and turns her around. The woman looks like an older version of Jasmine. She seems lost and confused. My queen, welcome back. Jasmine is horrified to see her mother, we'll call her Aida, back from the dead. This must be a bit jarring. Let me explain. Agla buys my kingdom, and you are my bride. The queen looks to her daughter. Jasmine? Where is your father? The end of that question sounds strange. Jasmine's mother begins to decompose before her very eyes. Jafar steps back. The queen uncovers her face to reveal a half-rotted shell of her living self. Jafar is disgusted. Ah! Guards, remove this hideous monstrosity from my palace. If I ever lay eyes on her again, it will be your heads. The guards are also taken aback by Aida's appearance, but they do their jobs. The queen makes eye contact with Jasmine as she's removed. We see them toss her outside the gates. The people of Agrabah are terrified as the queen quickly grabs a cloak left by one of the fleeing citizens. She covers up and disappears into the city. Back in the palace, Jafar is enraged. This is never to be spoken of again. The remaining guards, still shocked by what just happened, straighten up. Jafar looks to Jasmine, who can't put her horror into words. The sorcerer has nothing to say and storms off. Jasmine drops to her knees and weeps. Vodak and Aladdin are shown traveling across different terrains as time passes. They finally get to a large sea with a mountain in the distance. Open sesame! The sea splits and Aladdin is amazed. We'll say this version of the Den of Thieves is located somewhere in East Asia. The pair make their way into a massive cave where ancient statues line the walls. A large group welcomes Vadik home. These are the 40 thieves, and their king, Kasim, steps out to collect the staff Vadik retrieved from the mountain. Aladdin is given dirty looks by the thieves, but Vadik vouches for him and introduces him to Kasim. The king can immediately sense some sort of connection, but can't quite place it. Encouraged by Vadik's strong endorsement, Kasim tries to talk Aladdin into joining the group, as they're currently one member down. When Aladdin brings up Agrabah, everything changes. The king is from Agrabah and knows it well, but he hasn't been back in years. I came back to Agrabah one night, but I couldn't find my wife or my son. My family was lost forever. Kasim is taken aback at how open he is with the young man. Aladdin says he never knew his father, and only one thing was left behind by him, a dagger. Once the king sees the dagger, he knows the truth. Aladdin is his son. They embrace and are ecstatic at the family reunion, but Kasim is hesitant to return to Agrabah. He likes his life, and with his son alive, he finally feels complete. However, Aladdin can't abandon his friends and is adamant about returning. His father, selfishly, doesn't want to lose his son. If what you're telling me is true, a sorcerer has taken over the palace and is the master of a genie, you're going to go back there and do what exactly? Well, I don't know. If you and your men helped, we could- Aladdin! <laughs> We're talking about the 40 thieves here, not a revolutionary army. 
No, what you need is to fight magic with magic, son. Kasim goes on to tell Aladdin about the Hand of Midas, an item so powerful it can turn anything it touches into solid gold. With its power, he thinks they can defeat Jafar and never want for anything ever again. If Aladdin helps his father find the Hand, Kasim promises to help free Agrabah of Jafar's tyranny. Aladdin reluctantly agrees. Good man, now come meet your new family. From here, a montage begins, and three years pass, as Kasim and Aladdin take part in a rearranged version of A Whole New World, this time with the lyrics and tone about Kasim showing his son new lands as they search for the Hand of Midas and bond as father and son. Sidebar, if they were to still make an Aladdin TV series in this timeline, this three-year gap would be the place to do it. The montage ends on the father-son duo finally finding the golden relic. In the tail end of an exciting adventure, Aladdin is able to retrieve the hand and passes it to his father. They see the legend was true as Kasim's cloak is turned to gold before their very eyes. They narrowly escape the booby-trapped temple it was kept in, then celebrate with the 40 thieves. Aladdin is now in his early 20s with the makings of a full beard that matches his father's. He's over the moon that they finally have the means to return to Agrabah and defeat Jafar. However, cautiously, Kasim pulls his son aside and they talk privately. Son, we're not going back to Agrabah. What? The men won't go for it. I can't force them to fight a sorcerer. Even with the hand of Midas, it's a lot to ask. Well, forget them. We could do this together. With a hand on our side, Jafar doesn't stand a chance. They are my family, Aladdin. What kind of a leader abandons his followers? What kind of a father abandons his son? Kasim is cut by Aladdin's words. After a moment, his pride takes over. I'm sorry for what you lost, but you can't go back now. You know that. I'm not going with you. I can't. Well, you can't go back. I won't run away. What else can you do? The right thing. I'm your son, but I can't live your life. Aladdin and Abu take off on his horse, his father shrinking in the distance. Kasim stubbornly gets back on his steed and rides off in the opposite direction. Aladdin has been fooling himself, and the heartbreaking thing is he knew he was, but that sense of belonging, family, a real home, he thought he had finally found in his father. But in the end, all Aladdin was doing was just betraying who he really was. His friends needed him, and he abandoned them. This self-realization makes Aladdin even more determined as he begins the long road home. Agrabah is now known throughout the land as the home of the Sorcerer Sultan. He rules with an iron fist, and while the people of the kingdom hate him, they seldom speak up as Jafar has snuffed out even the slightest hint of rebellion. Jasmine has remained his personal servant, and he still takes joy in publicly humiliating her whenever he feels like it. She remains defiant, but with her father long thought dead and her people in peril, there's little hope to defeat Jafar. Genie has been kept in the lamp all these years, still hidden away in an isolated tower of the palace. Jafar keeps him there just in case a third wish is ever needed. We see a couple thieves discreetly make their way up the tower looking to steal the lamp. They get close when two palace guards seize them, and a voice is heard in the darkness. Another day, another defiance. Jafar steps out of the shadows as the men beg for their lives. When will you people learn to respect authority? His eyes turn red, and his snake staff glows with magical energy. Outside the palace, we hear screams of agony as people on the street look up in horror. It's taken him a few very difficult months, but Aladdin finally arrives at the closed gates of Agrabah. Down the side of the wall, he searches for something. Is it still here? He finds a small tunnel hidden by a few large rocks. I guess some things never change. Aladdin pops up on the other side of the wall and has returned home. He covers up his face with his cloak and makes his way into the city. He's shocked and saddened by the state of the once great kingdom. While Agrabah always had its problems, Aladdin being exposed to the worst of them, the city was never in such decay and utter hopelessness. The marketplace is half destroyed, and most people look like they're starving. Make way for the Sultan! At the sound of that booming voice, the people rush to their feet and begin to cheer. 
a small parade walks by with Jafar sitting atop an elephant with Iago on his shoulder. His guards flank the procession as Aladdin watches his enemy seemingly imitate the Prince Ali entrance from years ago. Jafar loves the adulation and throws a few coins into the crowd as he passes by. A group of people near Aladdin fight over the coins as he's pushed into the last guard. As the procession goes on, this guard angrily turns around and is revealed to be Razul. Aladdin is on the ground and his cloak has fallen off his face. It takes him a minute to see past the beard, but the guard recognizes him. Straight right! Aladdin gets up and runs away, but Razul's words strike fear into the streets. Whoever lets that man by will answer to the Sultan! Terrified, five men dogpile Aladdin before he can get away. Razul stands over him. You're coming with me. The guard brings Aladdin to a building on the outskirts of the city and throws him inside. It's pitch black before a torch lights up the room. Jasmine's mother is shown surrounded by ten men, her face covered by a veil. Who are you? Who's asking? The Queen of Agrabah. Now answer the question. Queen of Agrabah? Jasmine told me she's dead. You speak my daughter's name? How do you know her? Answer now or be turned over to the usurper! Sensing Jasmine's familiar pugnacious attitude, he knows she's telling the truth. My name is Aladdin, but your daughter knew me as Prince Ali. The Queen's guards begin talking amongst themselves. They recognize Aladdin as the princess's former betrothed. Prince Ali? I've heard the stories. They told me Jafar killed you years ago. Then I guess you're not the only one who cheated death. The Queen and Aladdin are caught up on each other's situations. Inspiring others by her true claim to the throne, Aida is the leader of an underground resistance, looking to defeat Jafar and reclaim Agrabah. Over the next few days, they're able to recruit even more people with the promise of the returned Prince Ali. As evidenced by Razul, the resistance even have informants in the palace. Altogether, through a few more secret meetings, they come up with a plan. Aladdin is to be brought into the dungeons by Razul. From there, he'll open Jafar's secret passage that was shown to him years before and let in a handful more resistance fighters, the Queen among them. They are to distract the guards stationed at the lamp while Aladdin retrieves it. Meanwhile, Razul will sneak the Queen inside the throne room to retrieve Jasmine before it gets too dangerous. They're expecting a fight with Jafar, they're just not sure when or where it will occur. They make no bones about the fact that this is a long shot, but they're willing to do what it takes to take down Jafar and save their home. Things go according to plan until Aladdin sees another figure in the dungeon with him. Withering away but still mentally fit, this man recognizes Aladdin. It's Jasmine's father, the true Sultan. Thought dead by Agrabah, Jafar has kept him alive for ransom should things go south with his reign. Not even the guards knew his true identity. When Aladdin lets the queen and her guards into the palace, she refuses to meet with her husband. Aida wants the sultan to remember her as she was, not this unnatural form that Jafar has turned her into. One of the guards is tasked with helping the sultan out of the dungeon while the others continue on with the plan. Aladdin tactfully makes his way up to the tower where the lamp is hidden. Two of the resistance fighters lead the guards away and Aladdin is given a clear shot. Meanwhile in the throne room, Razul escorts Jafar away for his daily parade. This is when the queen and her men retrieve Jasmine. Their reunion is brief as they hurry to escape the palace. Just as Aladdin touches the lamp, Jafar can feel something is wrong. He snaps his fingers and transports Aladdin and the lamp into the throne room. He re-enters to see his old foe. Impossible! He rips away the lamp with his magic. After all these years, the street rat returns! I should have skinned you alive, boy! In a desperate attempt, Razul tries to stab Jafar in the back. The sorcerer senses this and, through his magic, redirects the sword into his guard's belly. He falls dead. So, this is a conspiracy, is it? Who else dares to stand against the might of your Sultan? You are not the Sultan. Queen Aida steps out in plain sight. While he's distracted, Aladdin and a handful of resistance fighters jump the sorcerer. They try to pin him down while Aladdin reaches for the lamp, but Jafar is too powerful. He easily knocks them all to the ground and looks at the queen. I should have known, you repulsive cockroach! If your family won't learn obedience, your deaths will inspire the rest of the world to fear the name Jafar! But first, the street rat.
I assure you, I am thoroughly going to enjoy this. Jafar lifts Aladdin into the air as his snake staff glows. Just then, the doors to the throne room swing open and a large group enters. Aladdin recognizes them as the 40 thieves. They surround Jafar and distract him as Kasim jumps onto the sorcerer's back and touches his face with the hand of Midas. Dad? Jafar throws him off, but it's too late. He slowly turns into a solid gold statue, the lamp still in his hand. After a moment, Aladdin checks on his father. You came back. What kind of a father would I be if I didn't? The father and son share a look of understanding and embrace. Just then, a faint yell is heard coming from the statue. The golden figure explodes and Jafar is free. The effort has exhausted him and he breathes heavily. In the chaos, the lamp slides to the other side of the throne room. Two hands are shown picking it up. The sorcerer is furious. Fools! You think your little trinket had the chance of stopping me? Aglopa is mine! He creates a ring of fire around him and keeps everyone back. Then fight me yourself, you cowardly snake! A snake am I? Perhaps you'd like to see how snake-like I can be! Jafar has transformed as the freedom fighters and the 40 thieves try futilely to battle him. Just then, the room fills with blue smoke and bright flashes of light. Some of the smoke clears as Genie is seen sitting at a desk writing a Dear John-esque letter. He seems very emotional as sappy music plays in the background. Dear Jafar, I know it's been way too long since I last wrote you. I've been staring at this blank page for the last three years. Please forgive me for what I'm about to say, and know that this is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. <laughs> My life without you has no meaning, but the truth is... <laughs> You're the ugliest man who's ever walked the face of the earth, and I found someone else! More of the smoke dissipates, and we see that Jasmine has the lamp. No! Genie! I wish for Jafar to be stripped of his power and strength. Why, you little! Jafar, still in his snake form, lunges forward at Jasmine just as Genie zaps him. White lights flash, and when the smoke clears, Jafar looks old, thin, and frail with a long white beard and no hair on his head. He has been transformed into his disguise from the original movie, but now looks this way permanently. Jafar, I sentence you to walk the desert for the rest of your days. If you ever return to Agrabah, it will be your head. A few of the freedom fighters take Jafar out of the palace as Abu grabs Iago following them. On their way out, the true sultan, helped by one of the freedom fighters, enters the throne room and passes Jafar, giving him a dirty look. Slowly, the remnants of Jafar's magic fade away. The palace is returned to normal. Magic carpet reappears, and Jasmine's mother begins to fade away. She removes her veil to reveal her healed face. Mother! Genie, is there anything we can do? Genie solemnly lowers his head. It's all right, Jasmine. This is how things are supposed to be. But I just got you back. You don't need me, daughter. Everything you need is already inside you. The Sultan walks up next to Jasmine to see his wife fading away. They exchange a tearful smile. Take care of each other. I love you both so much. With that, her image disappears. Aladdin and his father tearfully look on, realizing how lucky they are to have found each other. It's a bittersweet moment as we dissolve to several weeks later. Jasmine's second wish was used on returning all of Agrabah to a pre-Jafar state. The streets are alive again, and the kingdom is in a position to correct the mistakes of the past and be more prosperous than ever. The crown paid the 40 thieves well for their help as they left shortly after Jafar was defeated. Kasim, however, has decided to stay. He's put in charge of helping the poor of Agrabah in trying to make sure no one goes hungry again. Aladdin and Jasmine's relationship isn't what it was, but things may be slowly heading back in a romantic direction. She lets Aladdin use his third wish, and with it, he frees the genie. We then get a scene similar to the original film. The goodbyes are emotional, especially with Aladdin. Genie flies off, and we see a shot of Jafar and Iago miserably walking in the desert. They look up at the blue streak racing by and lower their heads in defeat. With the genie gone and Agrabah safe, the Sultan, Jasmine, Aladdin, Kasim, Abu, Raja, and Carpet look out over the kingdom as triumphant music plays and magical fireworks are seen in the distance, spelling out the end. I gotta admit, this turned out to be a lot bigger in scale than when I first imagined it. 
I realize this would be a long movie, especially for a Disney animated film, but that's what these videos are for. Aladdin was and is still my favorite classic Disney film, so this was a ton of fun to take a deep dive into with all the changes I was able to implement. But what did you guys think? And what do you want us to cover next on the show? Leave a comment, give us a like, and share this video with your friends if you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check out the Fanscription Podcast, where we get to go deeper into the choices made for this series, and this episode in particular. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you next time. Made you look. This whole broadcast has been brought to you by Sam. It's everywhere. Get used to it. I don't like sand. <laughs>